You might want to open your Bibles to the Old Testament, to the book of Exodus. We'll be looking at chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 1, through chapter 4, verse 17. At least that's the text to cover the material we want to examine in the time we have in this sermon. While you're turning there, Exodus 3, 1 through chapter 4, 17, someone mentioned a few weeks ago, and we're often mentioning this over the years, about excuses. Excuses are simply made because they satisfy our conscience, but they will, may not be the real reason that we're trying to get out of something. If you don't have a voice, that's a good reason not to be able to sing, <laughs> at least normally speaking. And a lot of things you couldn't do. Well, that's a real reason, and I make that very obvious because it's clear that would be the case. But now an excuse is just something made up that probably nobody else will believe, but it makes you feel good to get out of what you know you ought to do. And there's some big differences in the two. And if you look at this passage of Scripture you will see that it deals with Moses at the burning bush, but you'll see something we call the excuses of Moses. The excuses of Moses. When God appeared to Moses at the burning bush, you'll remember it was at that time that he commissioned Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. The first thing that happened was what happens many times with, with brethren. He responded, that is Moses, by giving excuses as to why he did not think he was the man for the job. I want to say this right up front. If you read all of the rest of the Bible's teaching about Moses, you'll never hear him make any excuses at all after this one encounter with God. Now, it's a tacit thing in view of the fact he makes no more. Whatever God tells him, he sits about to do it. But what we learn by implication is when you go through these excuses, he grew in faith and trust in God, and he never made any excuses again. And in a similar way, as God's people today, members of the church, we can see how this is a good basis for study in our Christian conduct. The excuses of Moses and God's response to those excuses are serving as the basis of this given study. And again, for in a similar way as God's people today, we have received a special calling. Now let me pause here and say this. We have been chosen of God out of all the people on this earth. To be what the New Testament says Christians ought to be, how the church ought to live. Now it's interesting to see how God chose us and how he continues to choose. He does so by issuing a message to us as free moral agents and intellectual creatures. And he reasons with us through the gospel that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Savior, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6 that he's Lord of Lord and King of Kings. He is the Messiah. Beside him there is no other. He's the Savior. As he said to the Jews, Jesus himself, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. That's important to, to understand. Yet his selection process is based upon reasoning with us out of the gospel that Jesus is who he claims to be and who the Bible sets him forth to be. Thus the choicing process comes right down to me having to make a choice, to believe and from the heart obey the gospel and then choose to live righteous in the church all the days of my life. That's how God chooses who to be a member of his family, the church. Now, not to go contrary to deliver those in physical bondage, that's not where we want to focus when it comes to this lesson but to a world to deliver those in bondage to sin. This is what we're interested in. The excuses may make. Now, I, 
example a while ago was like somebody that's a church who doesn't do what the Bible says they ought to do and make up something that salves their conscience but doesn't really offer a genuine reason. But there are people all over the place who come up with excuses not to obey the gospel. And you've got to ask yourself the question, are these real reasons or are they excuses? Whether you're becoming a Christian or thinking about it or whether you're already in Christ. Too, of, too often, I'm afraid, we behave like Moses did. As great a man as he turned out to be in service to God, yet he made some excuses, lame excuses, in the beginning. Now, if you look at verses 1 through 10, you'll see that Moses is keeping the flock of his father-in-law. And Horeb is a, another name for Mount Sinai. And he looks in verse 2 and, and sees a bush burning and it's not consumed and he turns aside from his duties as a shepherd to go see that I think any of us would I think it's important to realize while we already know the account and thus a miracle was being worked here just seeing it and recognizing it to be a, a wonder a miracle didn't do Moses any good at all but it did say he who can make a bush and set it on fire and not burn it up. It just continues to burn, but it remains a bush. When he says something, we ought to realize we can take it to the bank, so to speak. Well, when the Lord saw that he turned aside, verse 4, then God calls unto him. Now notice he had to turn aside. He had to give attention to that thing. It had to impress upon him, this is not usual. But what if he hadn't? I see people all day long every day who see the magnificent evidences of God in this world. And it never dawns on them to look beyond that. Moses wanted to see what makes this bush burn and not be consumed. It's only then when he turns aside and does his part in going up to the bush that God speaks to him. Notice he called to him out of the midst of the bush, verse 4, and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. That particular question and Moses' response says much about Moses up to that point. He does not say, who are you? He just says, here am I. Well, if a voice came to me today out of a bush that was burning and was not consumed, and it called my name, I think I'd answer too. So these things are written aforetime for our learning in the Old Testament that we through patience and comfort of those Old Testament scriptures are encouraged in the hope we have through Jesus Christ because if he meant what he said and said what he meant in the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit himself in Hebrews 11 selects people like this as a great example of faithful adherence to God's will then how much more so would it be to us toward the truth of God today concerning our salvation? We, sense, we then see, and he said, uh, draw not near me, basically. Draw not thou nigh hither. God is emphasizing his holiness, his glory, and his honor. So he says, don't come here. You're in a special place. And he tells him to put off the shoes from off his feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. We should keep that in mind because this is not an actual appearance of God in his person not at all and yet to receive the message Moses is going to receive to commission him to do what he did he's to display an attitude of humility and holiness because he is in the presence of God then notice in verse 6 I am the God of thy father the God of Abraham the God of Isaac the God of Jacob and notice the impact it has upon the man. He hides his face where he was afraid to look upon God. Now here's a good point. He's not actually looking on God, is he? He's looking upon a representation of God. Yet that's said to look upon God because this is manifesting the miracle wrought by God. It tells us something about things from God. That's why the church is holy and why we should be living righteous lives. We should be setting an example of godliness in the world People should know that we don't live like the world. When it comes to our assembling like this for worship, 
then we should recognize that we are worshiping this God who's made a way for us to be reconciled to Him through the gospel and give us directions in His Son's New Testament as to how He ought to be worshiped. Thus, we're taught to worship Him in spirit, and here's that spirit in Moses, and in truth, as the truth directs us. So, and the Lord said, I have surely see, seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So, God hasn't ne neglected them. God hasn't forgotten them. He understands. But this is another point to keep in mind about God. Time's nothing to God. And He knows exactly when it's time to give us our directions. In this case, it was the exact time for Moses to do what he should do. Now remember, Moses has been away from Egypt for 40 years. For 40 years. He's been in a serene situation as a shepherd at the foot of Mount Sinai where everything is peace place of contemplation and meditation. Now also remember, it wasn't that way the first 40 years when he was sur surrounded, you might say, by the glory of Egypt. Right now he's got 80 years behind him. Now I think about that. He's already past the normal age of people living at that time. Yet he's going to do his greatest work in all these years preceding him or simply to train him to do this work. And yet it's going to take 40 more years for he was 120 when he died on Mount Nebo. Now that ought to tell us something about God knowing by his providential care, his great wisdom, when it's time for us to do what's what. If you read the book of Acts, you won't get this jumping out at you as easily until you think about it. But the apostle Paul was long a member of the church in preaching the gospel before he ever was called to do what we know him for so much, and that is to go on the three preaching tours and then his trip to Rome. All that other time was developing him and was experiencing him to do the things that God called him specifically to do as the apostle to the Gentiles. This ought to tell us in the church that when God allows a door to be opened to us, then we realize he's saying, you're ready for it whether you recognize it or not. Now, in this case, Moses did not recognize it. Now, you remember back when he left Egypt 40 years before, because he'd been brought up by his mother, he knew his people. And as the writer of Hebrews says, he chose not to enjoy the pleasures of Egypt, but to suffer the persecution that would go along with choosing to be with his people Israel. He thought when he killed that Egyptian that that was a sign that he would start leading the people out of bondage. But it wasn't. It wasn't the time. And he got in big trouble and had to flee. And it would only be 40 long years later. And that ought to be, we don't have time to go further, but that ought to rest upon our minds when it comes to let God have his good time and not try to outguess God or try to force any doors he's not ready to open. Paul would say, uh, a door has been opened unto me, an effectual door. Well, I wonder who opened that door. So we, at times, may seem doors are shut. Well, they're never really shut. There's never a time you don't live the Christian life and do what you can where you are. But I don't know what God may have open in the future. I don't know at all. So what's our job? Live one day at a time serving God faithfully, whatever door may open. And they may not be big doors like Moses had opened to him. They may be other smaller doors. But anyway, he's making sure that he understands what's going on in these verses. So as you go down through verse 10, he will say in verse 10, Come now therefore, in the light of everything I've just said, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Okay. If, if not enough has been said already because it's God who's saying it. The one who burns a bush and it's not consumed. The one who knew who this was. The one who's speaking to them. The one who says, I know all about the situation there is in uh, Egypt as far as my people being in bondage. I know how hurt, hurtful it is to them. Well, you'd think then he would say, I got to go home and pack and I'm headed off. But that's not what he does. Notice what you find when you begin to look at these verses. 
You'll find that he will say in Exodus 3 and uh, verse 11, Who am I? Moses has got a big problem with saying, I'm not, I can't do this. I can't do this. I don't know how many times over the years in trying to get members to be active in the Lord's church, you approach them and they sort of swivel up and say, I can't do this. I think some of the greatest privileges I've had over the years as a preacher is to see in people what they don't see in themselves as to their ability and what they can accomplish. Because first of all, I'm always looking at it. If you see me looking at you, I've got something in mind. <laughs> but I've always done that. I've always learned to try to look at myself because I'm told to examine myself to see whether I be in the faith, uh, to see what I'm capable of doing. Now, anybody that speaks here, John will certainly realize this, and Jonathan, Eric, but the first time that you ever get up to speak before a public group, you really wonder what those people are thinking. Why in the world does this man born to think he can be a preacher? Well, I look back over studying Restoration history and read about some of the early preachers that came down to us in history and see how they described how they started out. <laughs> and uh, one guy got up and started to speak and got so scared he just ran out the side door. So you never know. But it's that determination of heart. Well, in this case, Moses didn't want to get started. How can I do this thing? Maybe he's thinking about the way he thought it should be done back 40 years ago that didn't work out. I don't know. All I know is he's willing to argue with God and to make empty excuses. He was, what, a lowly shepherd, and as I say, 40 years had passed since he'd been in Egypt. He's an 80-year-old man. Don't you know when you reach uh, 65 or 66 at retirement age, you don't have to serve God anymore? Don't you know that? Well, he's 80 years old. Now, when you look at this, this caused Moses to question whether he was the right man for the job. But notice the question. He questions himself. But he shouldn't, neither should we. But now, God doesn't mess around with him. God's answer is quite quick. And he does so in verse 12. I will certainly be with you. If... If God were to say that to me, and he has through his word, but here's a time, as is said in Hebrews 1, God at sundry times and divers manners spake in time past to the fathers by the prophets. Here's one of those times. And Moses is being commissioned to deliver his people. And now he gets the message to go, and it's sort of like the paratrooper in the door. He doesn't want to jump. And people sometimes do that as paratroopers after they've been trained forever. <laughs> And they still want to jump. So God promised to be with Moses. And you know, that alone should have been sufficient. Paul later wrote, If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. We all know that God knew Moses. And he knew he was ready to go. So Moses didn't know he was ready to go. Moses is the one who had his doubts. We spoke in class this morning about when we committed sin, nobody the gospel to gain forgiveness, or we commit sin as a Christian and repent of it and confess it. We still let those things rise back up in our minds. And Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. So Moses should have been trusting in the God who already knew him well enough to appear to him, select him, and commission him. Now, if God has chosen us to do something, we can do it. It's that simple. Because he says, as Paul did, if God be for us, who can be against us? But some of us as members of the church use the same excuse today. We're trying to excuse ourselves by believing, well, I'm not up to the task. Rather than take what you've got and plug it in and use it and let it grow and develop, I'm not up to the task. Another thing is, if you're really and truly not up to the task, then get up to the task. It's true that by ourselves alone, we're insufficient. But if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, you'll see that Paul commenting to the Corinthians made it clear that it's God who makes us sufficient. But he's not going to do it when we have an attitude of not complying with what he called us to do. We often ask the question, how can I grow up in Christ? How can I become a stronger Christian? 
Well, you start with what you've got, and you make sure you do it, and that makes you ready for the next step. It's the only way it works. Look at what he did with the apostles. As far as the world of that day is concerned in formal teaching, they were uneducated, they were untrained men. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. And those they appeared before to preach the gospel recognized they didn't have that kind of education, but they did note that they had been with Jesus. They had about the best teaching anybody could have. In fact, concerning spiritual matters, they couldn't find any better than the master teacher of who there was no greater. So it's through Jesus that God has provided the same assurance that he provided Moses. Remember Matthew 28, verse 20, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. With his help, then we can accomplish anything he expects members of the church to do. That's what Paul said to the Philippians. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. I'll tell you right now, these are passages that have been with me and I've drawn from since I was a teenager. I remember the first time in a vacation Bible school, the teenagers were sitting down front. And I was probably about 15. might have been 16. I doubt it. I, somewhere in that area. And I was standing by a friend of mine. And before we passed the class, the preacher just out of clear blue called on me to lead prayer. I couldn't do it. I just nudged the fellow next, and he did. Well, while there's a lot of room for me still to grow, I think I've gone a little beyond that. But I'll tell you what, I didn't do it without saying, if the Lord told me that I could do it, I can do it. And if you don't have that much faith as a member of the church, then what have you been doing with your faith? As will become clear as we go through this, any excuse for not doing what the Lord has called us to do is a, simply a, a, a deception to ourselves. It's a smoke screen. And so it was with Moses. And so when that doesn't work, the next thing he says, well, what am I going to say? What shall I say? Exodus 3.13. You know, he knew that when he went to do what God commissioned him to do, if he went, there would be questions. And one of those questions is, who is this God who sent you to us? And that frightened him. But again, he forgot about the fact that God knows his heart better than he does, and God's already selected him, and he never selects anybody to do something that he can't do. When God tells the church to go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, when he tells us these things we're to be about doing, well, we can do them. There's no excuse for not doing them, and there are excuses. Maybe we haven't thought about that, but we should have. Help us iron our, our, our own excuses and get rid of them. Why are we to leave this country? We've come to consider our home for 400 years. Maybe that'd be one of the questions. You see how they acted because of their lack of faith in the wilderness wandering. And they even longed to go back to where they could eat. They forgot about the beatings they took. In fact, they weren't their own people, but they were slaves to others. And so those questions would be there, multiplicity of them. And what shall I say? Well, I think about preachers today. Preacher says, what shall I say? Paul comes back and says, preach the word. It's already there for you. You don't have to go invent anything. You just have to preach what God gave to you. As he told the prophets, just preach what I put in your mouth. Don't do more or less. So we have it. It always bothers me to hear preachers get up and say, I'm a gospel preacher. And yet in the process of preaching, they talk more about things of this world not even using it to, make, to really illustrate something about the Bible. Well, it's there. I don't know what I would say if it wasn't for things like this. What do you say if you're not going to draw it from the Word of God? Well, Moses expresses his inadequacy, at least as he saw himself, in knowing what to say. But again, God knows exactly. And so he says, thus you shall say. Exodus 3, 4, 14, and verse 15. So God tells Moses what he needs to say in response to their questions. Question, as I said earlier, has he told us what to say? Do we know where to get the message of God? Do we know how to point out the proofs of the Bible for 
God's existence or Jesus Christ being the Son of God? Do we know what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and how he works? Do we know the plan of salvation? Do we know about the church, his work organization, and so on? Well, it's all in the Bible. If I'm going to preach to you about the church, where do I get my information? It's God's Word. So whether it's being put to him as it was to Moses and other prophets at that time in a direct way, or whether we go dig it up out of the Scripture, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, it's there. It's up for us to read it. You know, Moses had to turn aside when that bush came into mind. He had to look at it for a while, see it wasn't burned up. And then he said, I'll go up there and find out what this is all about. Well, of course, I think he got into something he wasn't expecting. But at the same time, he had to have that interest. And sometimes people can see things all around them and they just, they're oblivious to it. They don't realize there's something said there. But when he did go up there, went to the right place, God began to tell him and even answer his own questions. So we try to excuse ourselves by saying that our knowledge is inadequate. Well, whose fault is that? If our knowledge is inadequate, whose fault is that? It's not God's. It's not my brethren. Ultimately and finally, it comes down to me. But as I say, God has told us what to say. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And you see what it's set out in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul says, now, I, I gave you this. This is what caused you to become Christians. It's basically what he's saying. And you go on through the scriptures and you'll see he draws from what he had already taught them, the gospel that made them Christians, and then continues to write for the whole New Testament is God's word, teaching us how to live the Christian life. And so, as with Moses, we have no reason, maybe excuses, but no reason for saying, what shall I say? As we return to Moses, we see that uh, despite God instructing him what to say, he still comes up with another objection. Going we'll to learn a little bit about long suffering, then here's a good place to see something about God's long suffering. Although he does not mince words, he said, Well, what, what if they won't, or suppose that they won't believe me? Exodus 4 1. So notice, who am I? Well, I'm not good with words. And now the matter of once I tell them those words, or they won't believe me. Well, I found as a preacher of the gospel, if you consider all the people that have, just me alone, have heard the preaching of the gospel and the teaching, far, 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 far more have not responded to the gospel than have. But that tells us that's not our responsibility, is it? Our responsibility is to sow the seed of the kingdom, to be true to the word of God, to live as it teaches to defend the faith, to preach the gospel. It's up to that person who hears just what they're going to do with it. And the Bible's already vaccinated us against that because it makes it very clear that as far as the great many people in existence, a whole host of them, most of them, in fact, will not hear and obey. How many of those who do obey? Many are called, but few are chosen. Well, is he afraid of failing? Evidently, that's what he's trying to say. Uh, has he already forgotten that God will be with him? Well, God responds in a unique way, I think, in equipping Moses with uh, several, and notice, convincing proofs. Proofs. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good, First Thessalonians 5.21. God just doesn't say, I'm God, and I believe me because I told you, or Jesus says, I'm Jesus Christ the Savior, but I'm not going to give you any proof. The Bible abounds with proofs. And nature itself, in a general way, abounds with proofs of deity. But look at verses 2 and 5. He gives him a rod, which when he throws down turns to a serpent. Then he says, you take your own hand, put it in your bosom, take it out. Verses 6 and 8, well, it's leprosy. I imagine that scared Moses quite a bit because it's incurable. But he tells him to put it back in, take it out. Everything's cured. The water, which will turn to blood when dropped on dry ground, Exodus 4 and verse 9, verse 9 of chapter 4, and it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, then he tells them to do this with the water. Now, God has always had a way of saying, this didn't originate with man. 
this came from God. Every miracle done by Jesus says God's behind him, that he is who he claims to be. When it comes to the scriptures, the apostles' doctrine, the gospel, God's proven that it is from God. You know, in uh, science, the science that basically rules the world, it only deals with empirical evidence. And they'll tell you you cannot prove anything about being a Christian. When you see the fruit borne by a faithful child of God, if that's not proof, I don't know what it is. By their fruit ye shall know them, Jesus said. And so of the church, the church by living as the New Testament teaches, bears out things in the lives of the members that says God is here. God is working. Yeah, but what about all these folks and the great majority of them that doesn't do this, that, or the other regarding God or even speak against him? Some claiming to be his friend to post what he says in his word. Well, there's always been that kind of thing. You think about there was the first two created, Adam and Eve, both sinned. Then Cain and Abel, one sinned. Then you come on down after them all the way up to the time of Noah, and their minds were corrupted. Only Noah and his household were saved. Because one or two are saved, and the great majority chooses to be lost, doesn't mean that the two who were saved were ridiculous and absurd in their thinking. We are too much moved by the majority of what happens. But the fear of failure can certainly cause problems with all of us. You have to get that out of your system. You have to have the attitude that says, if God said for me to do this, then I'll do it. I'm scared to death, but legs, you're going to have to take me anyway. I'm going. So just as God gave sufficient proofs that he's given us evidences that are necessary to convince the honest and sincere person. People say, well, you can't convince me of that. And I may respond by saying, well, with that attitude, I never will convince you. But I can offer proofs that do convince. They just may not convince you. Sometimes in debate with atheists, you say, well, what would God have to do for you to believe that he is? Now, I suggest if you know of an atheist who understands what he's really saying he is, then just ask him, what would God have to do to prove that he exists? And then ask the question as far as, what would Jesus have to do to prove he's the Son of God? Well, our minds, if we know the Bible, begin to come up with all sorts of things. I can point to the empty tomb and sum it all up as far as Jesus being the Son of God. So a lot of people just aren't going to believe. They don't intend to believe. They don't like Christianity. But you have to deal with them. Some may honestly don't have anything but that kind of background. So you have to make them think if they will. So the Word of God is designed to produce faith, Romans 10, 17. How does it do it? John 20, 30, and 31. By the things in there that prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Especially its evidence concerning the resurrection of Christ, as I mentioned. You could also mention fulfilled prophecy and various other things. So with such age, we cannot justify our inactivity in the preaching of the gospel of Christ to every creature. We would think that at this point in our study that Moses would obey God. But he offers a fourth excuse. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Well, that's found in verse 10 of chapter 4. I'm not an eloquent speaker, so I can't do anything. I've watched people like this sometimes and watch them in their regular conversations and they can talk a blue streak. Well, why are they saying that? If you can talk a blue streak talking about fishing or hunting or politics or whatever else, why can't you learn the Bible well enough to talk that? I'll tell you exactly why. You don't have the interest. It's that simple. You just don't have the interest. Brother Foy Wallace was writing somewhere to go to a gospel meeting. And he related this, that he sat down across from, on a train, of course, they traveled in those days, across two women. And in the process, as they were yakking at one another, they wanted to find out about him. And so they turned to him, and he declared that he was a Christian and a gospel preacher, and he was going to hold a gospel meeting. And they plopped up immediately and said, well, we don't discuss religion or politics. He said, well, I don't discuss things I'm not interested in either. And that's just about what it comes down to. That's really what it amounts to. 
God removed this objection. You know what's an amazing thing when God calls me, and he did in calling me to be a Christian, to use my talent to serve him. He already knows my weaknesses. But he called me anyway. Which says, whoo, I can overcome them. I can overcome them. If God called me, I can do what he wants me to do, Exodus 411. God can make up anybody's shortcomings if we'll just do the best we can where we are. And you'll be ready for something else. He promised again, this is the second time, to be with Moses, verse 12 of Exodus 4. And notice how he had arranged uh, for Moses' brother Aaron to be his mouthpiece, Exodus 4, 14 through 16. Remember, Aaron was sent earlier so as to arrive about this time. So God can work all those things out, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 27. God can work it all out. Now, some Christians try to use this excuse as well. But if you read 1 Corinthians 2, 1, and chapter, verses 3 through 4, you'll see that the Apostle Paul didn't allow that kind of thing to stop him. And it has not stopped anybody that's really faithful to the cause of Christ because they know when they became a Christian, they're not to live like everybody else. There's things they take upon themselves to do that only the church can do. There have been folks who have overcome speech impediments to become preachers. And I know of one who's dead now who did that because he wanted to preach so bad. At the very least, we can make use of those who can speak. When Cornelius was the first Gentile convert, told to send to Peter. Notice he brought people in to hear what he was going to hear. Well, that's what other people can do. If you don't feel comfortable teaching something, there's somebody else who can, and you can learn from them. And if you look at Acts 10, 24, and verse 33, that can give you an insight into things as to why that's there more than why we usually refer to it. Now, we've considered the excuses Moses gave, but as mentioned earlier, they were really just smoke screens. The true reason for all these excuses is is in verse 13 of chapter 4. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. You know what he's saying, don't you? Get somebody else. He didn't want to go in the first place. And that's basically what happens with some members of the church when you ask them to do something. Can't you get somebody else? One of the simplest things to do is Wait on the Lord's table to serve it, and you'll be surprised if people run from that like you say, expecting them to be shut in a room with 50 cobras. Do what you can do, and you'll be ready to do something else. He didn't want to go. The thing you have to do as a Christian is say, now why am I offering these excuses? And be honest with yourself, say, I wouldn't offer any of them if I really wanted to do it. So you have to come be honest with yourself. God already knows what you're up to. You can't hide anything from him. He already knows it. And so you have to simply say, if God's called me, if this is a duty I have in the church, then I will do my best to do what I can. Look at verses 15 through 17. And thou shalt speak unto him and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. God's taking care of everything. He has no real reason, never did, to back off. And that's the way we are today. If we fail these lessons in the church today, we have far greater things we're rejecting than Moses ever did. And we're not following the example that's given here to show us that we should. So all I can say is, is that excuses can cause you to not be a good steward of the things God has put into your hands. And thus what is called for is repentance. If you are not a Christian and you're trying to figure out ways to not do what you already know Bible plainly teaches, then you ought to learn from Moses and just be honest and set aside those things and obey the gospel and be a Christian. If it's a child of God, surely you should have known this a long time ago if you've read about this. 
And you wouldn't want to offer any excuses. You have no reasons, but you just offer excuses. Well, realign your life according to the truth and do what you know you can do and grow and develop. In other words, you need to repent of that. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to do so this morning by believing in Christ with all your heart, repenting of your sins and confessing your faith in Christ and being buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. And need I say, uh, as a Christian, if you've sinned, we urge you to repent of them, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. And we urge you to do that while we stand and while we sing. <laughs>